What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Creating Wealth Podcast, where I, Kyle, from Kyle Curtin Real Estate, interview local top dogs in the real estate investing, wealth building, and personal finance industries. Let's build together. What's up, guys? This is the second of a two-part episode with an extraordinary guest. Sean has an amazing real estate story so far, from working on the financing side at Lehman Brothers during the 2008 recession, to acquiring his own multifamily investment properties for his portfolio, to running a very successful and quickly growing lending company. In the second part of this episode, Sean and I talk about utilizing the current events of intense material shortage and implementing a strategy to plan ahead for future projects, being able to utilize multiple avenues on one transaction, innovation and the crowded trade concept and much much more this is a really crazy episode and i hope you enjoy let's jump right into the episode i'm honestly i'm so blown away sean like it it just like everything that you guys are doing like it, it's so impressive it's crazy you know <laughs> I'm, I'm just getting lost like oh my god older than i look so we've been on it i mean i've been in real estate I bought my first triple decker in when I graduated college in 2001. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's been a while. We've had some time to like, you know, and I sold it in 2006. So, um, and then watched the market collapse and then bought again in 2010. So, you know, yeah, we've had, we've had some time to like see some cycles. Yeah. Uh, and now come around and, and, and do something different as lenders. And eventually we're going to go back out there. We'll probably raise a fund to go out and buy properties. Or, yep. you know, we continue to do small investments once in a while, like on a personal level, you know, we found, um, you know, we had a situation where a client, you know, effectively handed us a project they were doing, you know, they're great developers, they normally do, you know, ground up projects or much larger, you know, multi-million dollar projects. They picked up an amazing deal in, in Roxbury and I had the project around the corner and I said, Hey, what do you think about this? And I was like, oh. I was like, are you asking me to lend it or lend on it or asking me if I want to buy it? You know, they're like, and they're like <laughs> they're like you know what you're right it's a crazy good deal we're gonna do it and we're like all right we'll lend on it and at the last minute they got you know had an issue on one of their projects and they were like well you know you know this is a five hundred thousand dollar project this is a you know five million dollar project we're gonna focus our efforts on the five million dollar project do you want it and we're like huh oh, cool. yes <laughs> we, it. We, did, you know, we did a condo conversion uh you know with my brother um and that's a side business. So my, my lending business is my full time, I say my my day job, mm-hmm. my real estate investment is what you know, we used to, I mean, it was kind of always a side gig, but really used to be a lot more like time on the side. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, my brother and mother and we have a team do that kind of and it's more of my retirement, but occasionally there's a cool project that we just can't say no to. Um, and we take it on. And so we just finished our own, you know, renovations, which, you know, we love, we think it's great. And it also allows us to simplify, sympathize with all of our clients who are like, lumber costs are up. And we're like, I don't know what you're talking about. We just lend. And they're like, no, but now we're like, ah, I can't get a vanity. And every single vanity is like six to eight weeks. And I didn't order it because I just thought I could go get one. They're like, fencing supplies like oh like yeah well let's pay for a fence you can't just pay for a fence you have to find the material like where is it you know like uh like yeah the greatest thing i just saw like somebody was on linkedin i saw a post up they have this like i don't remember what is this like thing before where i don't remember what it was it was like it's a picture with like a porsche in a garage like story of like you know, guy comes out and, and opens, buys a house and finds this vintage Porsche, you know, priceless Porsche, Porsche. And that same photo, you know, they had in there, you know, like, you know, homeowner buys this, unspectacularly opens the garage and finds a unused sheet of plywood. <laughs> <laughs> Those pictures kill me, man. I, I see stuff like that on Instagram sometimes. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, like, not, not too political about it. No, you know, like I'm not... Uh, <laughs> uh, that political, but my 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 partner had was like sent me something where it was like, um, you know, it was like one of those caps like make plywood cheap again. <laughs> I know with all that stuff going on, like I can't look at a piece of plywood or like a two by four or something the same way. I'm like that thing's like a hundred dollars right now, dude. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, be careful with that. Don't drop that. <laughs> another one what was it it was like he's like his, he was like this guy taking his girlfriend he was like oh so you want to go somewhere expensive and like, home depot. 
I saw that picture. I love that one. Oh, oh man. man. <laughs> but, it, but actually, and that's one of the things that's like impacting the industry now. Like you really see yeah. it. Like people are like, products don't make sense. And like, you know, it's fine for what we're doing because we're doing a lot of lending to a lot of, I mean, our loans or anything from like, I would say you're, you know, just got to get like a $300,000 yeah, I made a $200,000 loan on the small end where somebody's doing something, you know, it's like a quick fix and flip, clean it up and sell it. Yeah. To anything where it's more, you know, extensive where you're talking about million dollar construction budgets, you know, so you're, you're doing a full gut of, you know, four high end units or, you know, something quite substantial uh, townhouses or some ground up construction. And on the smaller side, Lumber cost isn't really impactful. Timing is, right? So, you know, things where people are like, oh, you know, I like, I don't have as many vanity options anymore, right? Or, or I'm trying to get this stuff, but it's not available. Lead times are longer. You need to order it. I mean, I think hopefully it's making developers better developers that live through this because you can't True. just all of a sudden go, hey, when I need a vanity, I'll just go get a van. No, you kind of need to think about that at the beginning of the project. What am I going to need? Because I better order it now, right? You know, it's not like I can just, go get it. Um, and I'm learning that in my own project as well. It's like, well, I think we'll just go buy stuff now. Like you didn't think about this months ago. No, <laughs> we're in my lending business. You know, like I don't, I don't pay attention. Right. So, yeah. you know, if you're going to be a developer. You got to be a full-time developer. Part-time developers don't last too long. Um, but so I think it's making, so, so one side that's making people better developers, but on the, on the high, you know, on the high end where you're looking at like two by fours and things like that, like, yeah, lumber's making like roundup construction a lot more expensive. You're going to see like probably some projects don't make sense, right? The land values, right? People are, you know, just now grasping it that like, you know, I think people just sometimes look at a piece of land and go, oh, I'm going to buy the land and it's worth $500,000. Well, it was worth $500,000 when you could build your single family for $500,000 and then sell your property. The price of the property is still the same. But now you're, you know, if your project costs go up 20%, well, the squeeze has got to happen on the land bit. Now it's only worth 20, you know, to $400,000, right? You can't pay $500,000 for that land because yeah. your cost have increased. Um, and so I think that starting to come into play hasn't quite yet, but I think it's starting, but I think lumber prices are easing anyways. I think it's like a temporary, it's a supply chain issue, not a permanent like inflation issue. Mm -hmm. What else has happened that we're seeing is interesting? on that the, on, on kind of that lumber cost front availability yeah also i think people got hurt during the pandemic things took so long right getting inspections yeah um, but people forget the biggest problem which i don't think people remember but i only know this because i had my own very painful experience with it was national grid when they went on strike and they took like a year like if you need a meter replacement you're like oh i need a new meter and they're like that's great we'll be setting up an appointment for you you're like great and they're like going to be, it's like, and it's going to be in June. We're like, it's great. It's only May. And they're like, of 2022. And you're like, <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> call us back next year. <laughs> like, literally, I had to wait like six months. I had to borrow it. Like, they were a stock. They had the entire project done. And they're like, I just call and get National Grid and get my meters. And they're like, they just don't show up. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then getting inspections during the pandemic, that was tough when it was, it was hard to get inspections on your projects. And I think people are having that same issue now. And I don't know if it's a backup issue or if there aren't enough people working. I think that's another issue, but getting inspections is really slow in Boston. I don't know how it is outside of the city, but, but it's been pretty slow in Boston. A lot of guys are complaining about that. What else? Getting labor. I, I don't know if it's unemployment benefits, but it's hard to find good people. It's like hard yeah. to get people to go work. Like catching an Uber in Boston is impossible, right? Like it's like, you know, you don't have as many people working. Well, maybe it's, it, it could be unemployment benefits. Could be people were scared of COVID and, or a combination thereof. It's like, I get paid very little. I get paid a decent amount on unemployment and my risk of getting COVID and dying are relatively high. So therefore, I think, you know, the best option is to stay at home and not necessarily risk, you know, risk my life in order to get small minimal wages, right? So, you know, um, but it's, but it's getting tough, I think, in terms of people like being able to, get good people for their projects and get the projects finished. So anyways, that's a bunch of what we're seeing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely really interesting. I, I really like that point that you mentioned uh, a little while ago too about, <clears throat> you know, kind of taking 
like what's going on now with like the the speed and delivery of you know stuff like vanities and materials and stuff like into account for even projects down the line i I think that's super super interesting you know to just kind of you know like defend against like if something like this were to happen again you know and just kind of implement that into like a into your strategy pretty much you know like even like as a developer or whatever you know just to kind of like plan ahead for that um and just kind of start to like order things in advance instead of like just kind of going to pick one up or something you know like just in case something like this were to happen again i'll say some of the better developers were doing that already i mean other Mm -hmm. guys were more like not necessarily in a bad way but they they, they use their cash flow they they operate with less cash so everything's just in time delivery right like you know like the toyota system but you know doing that on your own home it's like well i'm not going to spend 10 grand on materials that I'm not going to need for six months because that's 10 grand I could have earning somewhere, right? Now, I think you kind of need to go back and say, all right, well, I'm going to have um, all that stuff sitting on site. Now, one risk you have is job sites get robbed. I mean, like yeah. they get robbed of everything. Like they, we had a job site get robbed of the copper pipes. And it was funny is because they get robbed of the copper water pipes. There's people living above. It was just one floor that was under construction. So that was like, and the tenants like, oh, water's not working. They're like, oh, pipes froze go there and there's no pipes to freeze somebody came in and robbed the copper pipes oh uh, my god <laughs> <laughs> the people are living there like this is ridiculous um but 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 yes ordering stuff in advance being more organized I, again we think people should operate with more cash we're always surprised sometimes when we see some developers that are relatively large developers and we as a lender we get people's finances so we have a good view on this and some guys operate and they borrow lots of money but they have lots of and they're like i want to borrow 90 percent for this project or 85 percent of the acquisition cost for this project because i want to be able to still have cash on the side so i don't mind paying you on money that i have in my bank account because yeah. i want to keep enough money in my bank account and and we think that's all right, that's it's it, it's costing you money, right? You're paying a premium because you don't necessarily you're you're keeping cash aside and you're paying interest on effectively cash that you don't need. Uh, but it's also when shit hits the fan, they've got the cash. Um, and other guys we look out there and and we see some developers out there that are like, well, listen, I'm going to be a high octane guy. I'm going to invest every single last dollar, right? So every single dollar of mine is going to be working. And that works really well when it does, right? Because you've got, you're making money on every dollar. But when the train halts and you've all of a sudden don't have liquidity and you need it, you're, you're getting in cash crunches. And we saw that throughout the industry, right? Like we saw what was happening. And I think a lot of guys now are like, hey, we're out of the pandemic, we're moved on. That won't happen again. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, and again, going back to 2008, when we're sitting there, liquidity drained a lot of guys weren't around then you know and some of these guys have been around i I think the guys that have been around for two cycles you know you know remember these things and they remember it very painfully because they got caught up in it and some guys went bankrupt and they're like you know like that's an experienced developer have you gone bankrupt no well then you don't have the experience right like um but those guys tend to operate with a bigger cushion or at least know what they're doing right they have some sort of backup plans a lot of guys have been operating. If you've been operating since 2010 till now, you've seen nothing but sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns, right? It's just been beautiful, right? And you get some beach, some sunshine, everything's operating. The pandemic, it was like, yeah, it shut down, but then it came back again so quickly. You were like, oh, there was this awful two months that I didn't know what was happening. And then boom, loads of cash and everybody bought my product. And you're like, ah, that's not the way, can, you know, we had our crisis, that was it. And you're like, no, that's that's not a crisis. That was a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think guys now really need to, like you're saying, plan ahead. You need to function, get more efficient and plan that there is going to be at some point in time, another shock that they can't necessarily, you're not going to see it. You know, you don't, you don't look at it and see it coming from a mile away and go, oh, there it is. Well, we've got this much time. It's kind of, you know, it, yeah, kind of, you can have some preview of it, but for the most part, how quickly things turn people are always surprised. And yeah. I was surprised as some people at how quickly ha- everybody else is surprised that things turn so quickly. It's just like, it happens. Um, so I don't know. I think, I think that's something that people are going to, for the next year or two, hopefully guys will start operating more cautiously. Um, I doubt it. 
but but I I think there's a lot of people out there that will, and those guys will do very well because of the pandemic. I think people that have been growing too quick and, and kind of like you're kind of slash and burn, you know, startup style, but for a real estate developer, when things do hit a downturn, they can get called out. And, and I think we, we did see some of it, right? I mean, it's it happened in the pandemic. A lot of people didn't see it because we're lenders. We see a lot of it because it circulates around. So you kind of know what's going on. But but that was interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds incredibly interesting. Wow. Um, oh, Sean, if I could ask, you know, kind of like what your vision is, like your long term vision, you know, for the company, like for you as an investor, what's kind of your your main main goal? Um, yeah, we haven't had time to think beyond next week. Um, no, <laughs> RD Advisors is a lender. I mean, I think we're, you know, one of the things we did during the pandemic, which is good for us, is we pulled back out of pretty much every other market but Boston. Mm -hmm. So we still have some clients, but we're not marketing for new clients. So we're supporting our existing clients in Pittsburgh, Columbus, and, you know, maybe a few other markets as long as they're existing clients, but we're not advertising for business outside of Boston. So we really focus it in and concentrate where we had our, you know, boots on the ground. We pulled out of New York city. We didn't like, um, we didn't like the economics. We didn't like the politics and we felt that the prices were too high to justify the risk. And so we kind of like wholesale pulled out of New York and we, we have boots on the ground in New York. And so long-term, I think, you know, we're, we're going to grow to be, I think we're already one of the, the the largest, you know, this this past quarter, we're probably one of the the biggest or most prolific, you know, non-bank lenders in 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 Mass in the greater Boston area. I wouldn't say Massachusetts because we're not doing so much up, but the greater Boston area. Um, we, we've grown, right? We're we're there. We're there. We're one of the, you know, we're kind of now an industry player. People know us and and we're here. Um I think keeping that momentum for the next couple of years and continuing to grow and consistently be one of the top three, you know, non-bank lenders in Boston is 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 where we're going to be. I think if we see, um, you know, substantial recovery or you know, we're eventually going to go into another market, right? We're raising more capital. Um, we have more lines of credit. We have more investors. We've kind of weathered this well. In order to keep growing the business, we're going to look for another market and open up in another market, right? Is that New York City? I don't know. I'd love it to be New York City because it's very easy. New York is such a big market. I feel like you can, you just open up there and you do 10 times as much business as you do in Boston just because the, the transactions are larger, the market is larger, but the value has to be there and we don't see it yet. I think if we do see the value there and we feel like that it's, it's you know, that prices come down or there's some opportunities there, I, I think that um will, will will lead us to kind of expand there um if not then we might look to you know expand and open an office and hire people in you know somewhere you know is it texas or the you know the southeast or somewhere we feel that it's uh, lender friendly growing somewhere where in the, the winter it's still warm um so that you know we have a place to go down and man the office yeah. Um, legislation is a big thing. I think people, you know, forget about for lenders that, you know, not every state is lender friendly um, and we don't want to be in every state. I think New York City and New Jersey are particularly lender unfriendly. We don't necessarily want to be there um, for that reason. But again, it's, you know, it, it is a big market. And then beyond that in terms, of, and, and then we're continuing to work on, I think, we haven't spent a lot of time on the marketing and the front end and the outreach. And that's kind of held us back. And it's one of the reasons that the pandemic, people didn't know about us because we, really, we didn't have a website for the longest time. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't, you know, pre-pandemic, we didn't have Instagram. We weren't on Facebook. We weren't in any of these places. And we're still barely on those places. We're just now getting out. Um, we weren't advertising Google. We paid zero for marketing. Um, what we did spend a lot of time on was we spent a lot of time on building up our investor base. We spent a lot of time on our bank lines of credit, building up our relationships with our capital providers. And what people don't necessarily know is on the private lender, it's kind of like your local private lender that kind of like has cash and they lend you a million dollars. And there's other guys that like, they don't have any money, but they've hooked up with a Wall Street firm. They say they're going to do the loan to you, but really there's some other firm in the background that, that's table funding it. So it's not necessarily their money. And we're some, and we're kind of, you know, effectively a hybrid, right? We, we, we have our own capital. We have a large pool of capital. We have access to more capital if we need it. I'm in kind of like a, 
you know, I grew up locally, I have my own investments here, but I also spent 15 years in real estate, private equity and, and kind of on Wall Street. I've got great access to, you know, your large hedge funds, your, you know, your Blackstones of the world, your large, you know, essentially institutional investors, your pension funds um, that can provide us with capital if we need it for larger transactions. So we spent a lot of time on that back end on the capital front, which is why we were, we were relatively well capitalized when the, the pandemic hit. Um, and so then the future is us now. Now we've got that great backing. We've got that capital. We've got lines of credit. Two things. One, getting cheaper capital, right, for our clients. So we're able to offer lower rates to our clients and still put it on our balance sheet because I've got a banking relationship that believes in us that's giving us very low rates and access to capital. And, and so then I can pass that on to the clients and still make the margin that my investors want. And so... We're going to continue to try to push down our cost of capital so that we can offer, you know, lower cost loans and more products to to our own, you know, borrowers. So that's one thing that we're working on actively, kind of in the background that doesn't get seen on these things. Two, getting the word out that we exist, right? So that we are lenders out there. So people see us, they they know us, and they go, oh, so RD advisor, but he's got a nine one seven number. I moved back to you know, I moved back to. Boston to be in New York City. When I came back to the US, I landed in New York City. Now people don't pick up my phone call. They have 917 instead of 617. Like, no, I grew up here, but um, <laughs> it's gone a long time. Yes, I'm local. But um, you know, getting back out and meeting people and then eventually opening up a, a second office, um, you know, whether that's in New York City or, or or another place as well where we actively begin lending. I mean, that's it. And then longer term from that you know, where we go with our investing at our heart, you know, my partner and I, you know, are real estate investors, right? Right now we're investing in the real estate debt um, by being a lender. But at our heart, if something came up and, you know, we'd much, doing equity investments is fun, right? As a lender, you never get the upside, right? I get paid the interest and that's the maximum I ever get, right? You know, you get your interest and maybe some fees in there, but like, you know, you don't make 20 times your money or 10 times your money, or, you know, you don't hit any help. It's, it's, it's bunts and singles, right? You, you get around the bases and you, you, you may hit some runs in and that's what everybody wants, but you, you don't get the joy of a grand slam, right? You're like, um, you know, and so I think eventually if there was a downturn, um, you know, one of our goals would be to, you know, start, you know, investing on the equity side, which is a bit of our background, um, and go out and do some of our own developments, pick up some properties on the cheap. And, and that's what we've done in the past. And so I can see that in the future, but I don't know that's going to happen. I mean, you first have to have a downturn. Then it takes a long time for people to expect, you know, for the prices to kind of reach rock bottom. And then sometimes in the middle of a crisis, they're rock bottom because there's no liquidity in the system and there's no financing. So you have to buy it all cash and, you know, like it's kind of work, worth rock bottom prices, right? And then you kind of have to wait that sweet spot, which is like, you're kind of still at rock bottom prices, but it's at the bottom and you're heading back up. Because you buy, buy like it, when it's heading down, you're going to catch the bottom and you have to wait all the way to head gets up. You kind of want to like, and, and I think that's long time out. So I think that's that's a while a ways from now. But I, I think, I do think that we go back to being the equity side. And then on the personal side, I still have my own personal investments, which again, we just, you know, if we see something small that, you know, or, you know, you know, we end up doing, it's great. If, you know, we do one or two flips every other year, just because we find something and we have some spare time. And for some reason we think we forget about how painful the last development was. We are like, oh, I'm so bored. We did do that great development. We've completely forgot about that whole time. We were yelling at each other because there, you know, somebody forgot to order this part or this, and you can't get a plumber out and this, and people don't show up. And for, you know, you can't get national grid out there, water and sewer. I mean, it's like development is, is painful. Like, people forget it. Like there's, there's a reason people get paid for it. When we forget about how painful it is and we only remember how nice the project came out and then we had a nice sale, then we'll do another one. <laughs> And yeah. then that project will do it. And then we'll remember how painful it was. We won't do another one for a year because we're like, we're not doing that again. We're like, um, and then we'll do another one. You know, like that, that, that's how it'll go on my personal side. And maybe we'll buy something else, like, you know, as a long-term hold, but it's hard to find good deals. It really is. I, yeah. I, I even the deals I see now, then people are like, it's great. It's off market. It's 20% below market. And I was like, yeah, but I think market is like 25% above where it should be. So like now I'm only paying 5% above where I believe it should be. Like, oh, that's a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's uh, it's really crazy, you know, trying to, trying to find stuff off market right now. 
especially. <laughs> yeah, or on market. I mean, I you know, you might we bought a lot of our stuff off market, but some of it was on market. And then at a point in time where you know, sometimes on market deals aren't that bad. You kind of you know, do an on market deal, sits there for a while, doesn't sell, and throw in an offer. Yeah. You know, don't be afraid to put an offer out there, you know, just like you know, like maybe it's going to hurt somebody's feelings. And you're saying, I'm sorry, it's going to hurt your feelings, but here's an offer. And they're like, actually, I need to sell. It's not that bad. Right. And you know, so occasionally people get a deal. Um, and, and, and I think that's what we're seeing. I think we see a lot of our guys actually are getting good deals. Like th there are people that are getting good deals. It's just not as many. The other thing that people are forgetting about is we've had this foreclosure moratorium for how long? We haven't seen that backlog of properties. I don't know how big that backlog is, right? There could be a huge, there's been an eviction moratorium and there's been a foreclosure moratorium. And I don't, you know, the eviction moratorium, I think for Massachusetts, it's, it's forget, you know, the state. And the, I, I think that's not going to have a big impact on people's ability to do investments. You know, maybe there's on the margin, people will get out and so that you can have vacant buildings so you can renovate because... You know, guys love to tell me that they can buy a property and I'll get that guy out in a month. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you may, but if you don't, he could be there for two years. Yeah. And so, and if he's not paying rent and you've got a hard money loan and you can't get to the rehab, it's going to be relatively complicated, right? And if you can carry that, that's great, right? Like if you can, you're doing 20 of these and you're like, I'll take that one with a tenant and all dollar cost average it, right? Maybe he comes out in a month, maybe he comes out in two years and I can carry the project, fine. But if that's your first project and you just want to do it and you're like, that's my last dollar in and I'm just going to gamble it, like, mm, that's not a bet you want to take. Yeah. Um, but the same thing with the foreclosures. I don't really know. Like, I, I think there's a huge backlog. I don't really know if there's a backlog, right? Like, what are the companies? What are the lenders going to do? Like, you know, the hard money lenders. I mean, people haven't talked about this, but you know, we were lending on something that did was foreclosed on, right? So it was a vacant home. It was eligible. Nobody was there. Went through the process. The hardest thing was to close it was because you couldn't get title insurance, right? Because people don't realize that you go and somebody goes and says, okay, the title company goes, well, I don't want to put title on this. Why? Because the owner, prior owner of it for foreclosure goes back and goes, well, guess what? You know, was it a fair auction? Yeah, it was a fair auction. We published it. We followed all the rules. But it was in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. So people, you couldn't aggregate people there. Well, no. So you're in the middle of the pandemic, aren't allowed to get tons of people outside bidding on a property. And it was a fair auction. Well, okay. So we're going to take this to court, right? And, and so it's made it a little bit harder to get title insurance on properties because the title insurance, you know, didn't want to insure that risk. And so that was another reason, even for private lenders, even for things that qualify, that there was some backup. So I think we might see some more deal volume come through in terms of foreclosure volume that's been pent up. And I think that'll make a change to prices of, I don't think it's gonna change the price and cause the market to collapse. And it's like, this was a foreclosure thing and everything's gonna collapse and the price is not. I don't think that's what's gonna happen. But I do think that there's gonna be more deal flow for those marginal guys that are like, now they're like, well, I'm trying to buy, you know, there's no, there's less off market deals. There's less deals out there that are foreclosures. There's less, and that, you know, you're buying into something at a price that is this, you know, pretty close to the price that you want to sell out to a family. I think they're going to find, you know, more deal flow, but I think it's going to take a while. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. It's not like, Hey, mask off. Boom. We're all going to the auctions again. And we're going to buy it. And I, get to the deal. No, I think it's, it's going to, there's going to, there's a process behind it. It takes a little bit longer. So um, but that'll be, that'll, that, that'll lead to a lot more deal flow for all the, you know, the, all the lenders and the guys that are flipping homes across the industry that all been coming in here complaining, um, about lack of deal flow. Um, uh, they'll still be able to complain about lumber prices for, for the next little while and lack of availability and no labor and the cost of plumbers and electricians and eight, of course, HVAC, <laughs> um, yeah. good, cheap HVAC guy, um, um, <laughs> mini splits i'm doing mini splits now i don't know if i like mini splits but we're doing mini splits um and then what else i mean i don't know it's interesting i, I think people will try to you know like uh, people adapt was, and seeing cool projects people are coming out with now i mean ordinances i wonder what's going to happen like i think there was some you know people are pushing to do more eco-friendly projects um Oh, and more building alternatives, right? When two by four costs go up, actually, we're going to do, we're looking to do an event on this and, you know, we'll, we'll publish it out there soon, but we're going to do an event on kind of alternative building methods to like, you know, the, the stick framing. So, you know, you're talking about, 
you, you know, we have one client using Fox block, right? Which is effectively, you know, framing it up and pouring concrete in there, but it's already insulated. So it's like hmm. time saver. We'll see, right? Is it time saver and cost saver? Is it more efficient? I don't know. We'll ask at the end of the project. You know, we're using, you know, building off site. Like, I, I think this is huge for Boston, right? Maybe it's not such a big deal if you're building stuff in the suburbs, but like, you know, I think if the next project I might do, like, I don't know, like a guy bringing a bunch of guys in, having them stage on site, build it on site, all the elements, the weather getting wet, your two by fours, your, your, your building is getting wet as it pours in the rain. You can't build in the winter or do you just build it in a factory, big ass factory in New Hampshire and ship down panels or, you know, effectively, you know, prefab, you know, various forms yeah. of prefab and factory built product. Is that, you know, like, why are my walls being built on site? What couldn't somebody, you know, and, and then also in terms of like, when you have a factory setting, how much more efficient is it to like, you set up the project and you're building a dozen of these, right? And you're doing it all at once and you're saving on lumber costs because you're more efficient. You're not, you know, you, you figure out what you're doing with all those bits. Well, you can take that bit, you know, like I have the problem now, I'm doing my house, I've got leftover tile. Well, it does, where does it go? And it goes, well, I don't have another project. So, you know, I just return it, get a vendor credit back of a small amount, you know, relative to what I paid. And then I've got all these bits of lumber of like, you know, that I was doing for my finish. Well, it's kind of expensive, right? All this stuff, but I don't have a product that's used, you know, projects that using the exact same trim. But if I was building it all in a factory, I would just say, well, you know, then I can use just in time delivery because, you know, I'm using those things, they're coming in, it's much more efficient. So I think we're going to see some of those things, guys using a little bit more prefab and, and we're going to have a big, you know, hopefully a lively discussion about all those building techniques. And there'll be a lot of builders that are interested, like, oh man, you mean I don't have to frame in the freezing cold and you know, <laughs> bang my thumb and have it, you know, fall off like, oh, this is, this, this is interesting. Um, so I think that'll be exciting. Um, yeah. And, and again, like with, with the HVAC stuff, with everything else, new technologies coming in where people are like, you know, mini splits before were thing where I didn't really hear people talk about. It. We did it in some project. We did it with some passive houses and some all electric stuff we were working on for that. Like, I don't know. And, and still some of our guys, you know, like, I'm not going to install that. It's crap, but it's like, works fine in small spaces. Right. It's like kind yeah. of efficient, right? Like, you know, it's like, it's not perfect, but you know, it's, it's all right. And like, you know, I'm using spray foam, like using, you know, a lot of spray foam, like, shit, like my house is a lot warmer than it was when it had no insulation. Right. Like it's like, <laughs> kind of keeps cool. Like, it's like living in a cave and it's like, you know, like it's closed cell, you know, like spray foam, like shit, you can do a lot different things with your heating. You don't need to have as much heating system. Right. So, um, you know, I think that's changing on stuff whether people are going to use all electric, right? So if you don't need forced hot air, you don't need gas for that. Now you're using electric on the mini splits and you're like, well, my big ass gas range is kind of cool, but like, you know what? Having a little electric one that you just pop in the countertop and it's like, looks kind of cool and looks trendy on there. And if it's a small apartment, like I don't yeah. know if I really need gas and like with what plumbers are charging and having to get national grid out there, like hell with it. You know, I know some builders that don't use gas anymore. They're like, I'm going all electric you know? and they're building luxury condos. It's not like they're building like all electric, like, you know, shitty ass things. And they're building like luxury condos that people are paying some of the top dollars for because it's eco-friendly and it's cool. But the big thing for the builder is I don't have to deal with, you know, like national grid or, you know, the national gas and I have to do the extra plumbing, saving dollars on that. And there's no gas lines. And it's like, you know, maybe years from now, we'll be looking at it going like, you had what? You had gas running through your building that could explode, right? Is this right? Like, like you know, <laughs> somebody's gonna approach me like, did we really build like that before? Um, <laughs> built with wood, ran fire to 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 basically heat the house. Yeah, I'm gonna have archaic. Um, you know, yeah. I wonder if it would basically be a repeat of like how somebody nowadays would look at like knob and tube. You know, like yeah. you, you had conductors on, you know, like wooden beams and like porcelain, you know, I guess like connectors that would heat up. Like if <laughs> insulation touched that, your building would burn down. Like you guys were crazy. You know, yeah. it's probably going to just be a repeat, you know, like history yeah. repeats itself. And it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, it'll be fun. I mean, what else are we going to have out there? Um, we'll have... I, it's kind of way to think of my cars now. My, I don't have an electric. I don't have a Tesla. I have, uh, you know, uh, 
still have my gas powered car, but I still have my friends. Like, yeah, yeah. At some point in time, people are going to be like, wait a second, wait a second. Let me get this straight. You had a vehicle <laughs> that propelled itself forward by exploding, you know, fire and gas in the vehicle while you were sitting into it. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you put it that way, it does sound kind of odd, but it worked for years. <laughs> it did. Yeah. <laughs> Those parts smack together and bang some steel together and they just bang and bang and bang and move through some tires, right? You're like, yeah, but really fast. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, kind of where the future goes and especially having, you know, big events like, you know, the virus that really, you know, force you to adapt in one direction or another. Yeah, yeah. We've, I mean, it's. I think it'll be interesting. I mean, like the virus forced us to things that were changing adapted relatively quickly to how they would, you know, like before caused some laws to change, you know, had permitting change things that people thought were like a massive big deal like you know you couldn't order to go for cocktails well all of a sudden they discovered that like people order cocktails to go and that's yeah. kind of a good business and city kind of makes money off it or like parklets like hey you got a big city outdoor eating people would like to eat outdoor if we get rid of one parking spot we get to fit 20 people to sit outside and eat in the sunshine you know what let's do it <laughs> right like it's fine, right? We'll, we'll all be okay losing one parking spot. Like it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Losing two now, that, that's like... You know, <laughs> um, that's but, pushing uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so I think these things are, you know, like, you know, I, I don't know. I think it'll be an interesting year as we kind of like, as, see as we, I think we're going to come back to basically where we were um, pre-pandemic with some slight modifications that'll be you know, potential enhancements, but I don't know. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's what I've got time for tonight. I can answer some more questions. Yeah. I just looked at, we've been chatting a while. I know it's been like an hour and a half. <laughs> no. yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, throw one last quick question at you and uh, I'll, I'll let you go. Um, Sean, do you read and what is your favorite business investing or real estate book that you would recommend to anyone? Or, you know, if it's a podcast or like an article or anything you really like. <laughs> what did I read? Like when I had time to read stuff, like I always glance at the headlines every day. I don't feel like that's like the, the, the same thing, but like real <laughs> fundamental, like I think of myself as almost like a value investing um, guy within the real estate space, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically solid fundamentals, not looking at like the trend so much, but looking at the fundamental analysis. So I think there's things like if you're going to read, you know, step back from real estate, forget about real estate, start thinking about, you know, one of those things when, when I was there, I once talked to a lawyer when I was, you know, in the financing side and he never did anything in real estate. And, and he was the lawyer in, in, in the, the group, the in-house counsel. He says, no, 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 it's just boxes. Cash flow come in and cash flow goes out and there's some legal rules binding those things. And that's think that same thing with real estate and investing. There's these investing principles that you apply to anything and solid investing principles, you apply to real estate, you apply to, you know, you can invest in stocks, you can invest in private equity, you can invest in companies, but there's this fundamental analysis that you need to do that's, you know, there's competitive analysis and all those things. So I think for somebody who's in the real estate investing space, and I don't have a particular book in mind. But I would honestly say there's lots of great books out there in real estate, right? And if you're already in real estate, you've probably already read those books, right? That's why you're here. They were like, oh, this is great. This is interesting. And you're naturally drawn to it, right? I think the things that make it really interesting and in making separating some of the guys that are good, but not great, or have a different approach and do something differentiated is taking something else and reading it or the fundamental analysis. So whether it's, you know, what is it? I think it's... Um, you know, Warren Buffett's book, you know, it's like huge. The um, Intelligent Investor? No, I, I was thinking about is it was the autobiography, which is like Snowball. Oh, uh, Snowball? Um, yeah. Is it that one? I haven't read that one yet, but that book but is it's, very, it's interesting. very it's, thick. It's, it's like an interesting, like, you know, the way he, it's a little bit more like way he thinks about it. Um, you know, I think things like that are interesting for people to read. Um, you know, I, I think... Um, 
just think about how things get done in the city. So like, what did I read a long time ago that was interesting? Um, you know, or, or even something like Moneyball, right? Where, where it's outside of this, but thinking about like, you know, all these different things and sitting down and doing, you know, much more analytical approach than historically has been done, right? Somebody's going to, like, how do you get farther? Like if you're doing the same thing that you've read a book and every other investor that's read that book is doing the same damn thing, your results are probably going to be remarkably similar for better or worse, except the worst part is when they wrote the book, other people weren't doing about it. That's why they were able to write a book is because they did something slightly different for which they were able to write a book about. But now you're reading that book that has been a bestseller and like a hundred thousand people have read or a million people have read that book and are following that thing. Well, now that's like, that, that's like, you're no, you're no longer a, able to get that so what is that thing that you're doing that you read about that you apply that's outside of it so i think really you have to bring something else you know special into it um and you think about it differently and, and and again like that's how i think about real estate is like what are we doing not that it's that different but it's like well i'm basing it on a fundamental analysis approach right and i'm not trying to do things that different i'm just trying not to lose money right like yeah. at <laughs> a, a time when you know things are valuations are high right you know and, and we are being relatively conservative so that's you know and how are we thinking about it? we're thinking about ourselves relative to bonds right we're not necessarily thinking what we do on the lending side as i'm necessarily you know my clients are real estate investors but my investors in my business are looking at it and going i'm earning zero cash in my bank account and I'm earning what in treasuries? Am I earning 2% average of 4% over the 15 years, 3% over 10? Like, this isn't pretty good. And like, oh, you're doing 10% and it's relatively senior secured. Okay, how am I doing relative to that bench, the, you know, my benchmark, right? So, um, so anyways, I, I think it's, it's about finding something that isn't within the real estate space and reading it, something that I haven't thought about yet. I don't know. And, and it's maybe it's applying like the technology, right? So it's thinking about and peeling it back and thinking about, okay, if I'm a developer, how has it been built for a hundred years, right? Well, you know, at some point somebody thought, well, knob and tube probably is not a great idea. You know what? I'm going to do something that's different than knob and tube and, and I'm going to apply that in my buildings and they're not going to burn down. And he became a great long-term investor just because just his buildings didn't burn down, right? Like, and at the time that was novel that buildings didn't burn down every two years, right? But yeah. what is the same thing that you're doing as an investor that differentiates your product over a longer period of time, right? And, and you know, on the technology side or how you're thinking about it or how you're positioning your product. And I think that's interesting. That's awesome. That That's a really, really cool way of looking at that. That's going to get me thinking for a little bit. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it really is a, a super good point though. You know, I yeah. mean, like they're the same principles and ideas and everything. And at the time, they were a lot more innovative, you know, because it was much newer. But, you know, as more and more people, you know, digest and apply it, like, you know, more people just kind of collectively like move up with that, you know, so then like yeah. that same situation, like it would have to go around the circle again, you know, yeah, like more ideas to... would have to come out. And that's I like that a lot. Yeah, well, awesome. I mean, like in, in, in the hedge fund space or the, the trading space, people call it a crowded trade, right? So everybody, did, it was a great idea, great trade, and then everybody does it. Well, you're no longer able to create any arbitrage out of it, right? You're not yeah. able to create any arbitrage. You can't buy the single family and just flip it into, you know, a nice flip because everybody's already doing that same trade. Everybody's buying that single family and flipping it, right? Um, what is it that you're adding and doing differently? That's And, and, and that's, you know, and it's somebody bringing something in from, a completely different perspective or another industry or, or that different background that like revolutionizes things. Yeah. So Damn. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I got to get ready for tonight. I got to eat some dinner and get ready for answer a whole bunch of emails. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on here, Sean. No, that, that was absolutely amazing. That was, that was awesome. We're on um, social media. Can you and the company be found? I'll link everything below. <laughs> yeah. So we're on, I, I will put you in touch with my teammate, uh, sure. Ron, who is currently handling all of our marketing until we fill our marketing coordinator position. Um, but we're on Instagram, Facebook. Um, obviously, we have our website and we've got our email. And we even have a phone number. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. Nobody uses it. Don't worry. I don't even know if there's anybody at the other side of the line. We just keep it <laughs> just in case. Yeah. I don't think we have a fax number. We had to fax something the other day and I was like, 
I don't even know how. <laughs> um, but so so that's but we'll we'll hook you up. I mean, you can find us Instagram at RD Advisors is one place. Instagram is probably where we publish the most content, and we'll even we'll take this, we'll condense it down to an IGTV video. Um, yeah. We'll put it on there and then put a link to back to it. So you know view the short version here, the longer version here. Um, and so we make sure we get that out there. Um, and the same thing on Facebook. Uh, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link all that stuff below. And uh, yeah, thank you very much again, Sean. It, it really was a pleasure. I oh, could talk awesome. to you for hours. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We could, we should have had like beers here. Yeah, I feel like. Uh, I might have to implement that. <laughs> yeah, I did an event the other day and I had a beer. My teammate commented I had a beer in my hand the whole time. So he's trying to do company shots. And he goes, every company shot, you've got like a beer in your hand. And I was like, well, I didn't. And somebody else who came to the event was like, oh, so cool. You had a beer. It made it so much more relaxed. And we felt like we could, you know, like let our guard down. And this is more of a social event and we could chat. And it wasn't so like formal and stuff. Yeah. Like, like yeah. Hmm. But anyways, <laughs> great. All right, I'll let you go. Thank yep. you very much. I'll Thank talk you. to you soon. All right, soon. Bye. All right, guys, that concludes our Creating Wealth podcast episode for today. I want to thank every single person that has listened this far. It really means a lot to know that people can learn from me and with me as we build wealth together. Hopefully you can take home at least one thing from this podcast that will improve your life just a little bit. If you could, please check me out on social. That's at Kyle Curtin Real Estate on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm on Bigger Pockets. Until next time, let's build together. <laughs>